Today on Between the Lines, the ultimate lesson for those who watch power, want power, or want to arm themselves against power. When we meet my guest, Robert Greene, I'm Barry Kibrick. Robert and his book, The 48 Laws of Power, gives readers all the tools they need to understand what power is all about and how to use that information to benefit themselves. But I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was you, do need, you, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book, are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involves a lot of corruption. I'm getting a chance to really talk about what's real and the person. The feeling of having no power over people and events is generally unbearable to most of us. When we feel helpless, we feel miserable. No one wants less power, everyone wants more. Robert Greene, with his book, The 48 Laws of Power, will give you the ability to gain, observe, or defend against power, and in turn, empower yourself. Robert, welcome to the show. When we spoke earlier, I told you this is the first book in the history of Between the Lines that I read on my own that a publicist did not submit to me. And it's a, been published a number of years ago, yes. and I only have usually the new publications on. And what happened was, was I was talking to a friend, Nelson Davis, mm -hmm. and I always talk with him. He's a dear friend of mine, and I always quote from the book. And he says, right. you know, you always quote from the book. Why don't you have him on? Yes. And I said, well, because I never have anybody on that's not a, because I know him. So I am so honored. This is, a, this is history in the making. And I want to start because as the way I introduced you, yes. and I took a, a little bit out of the book that says, the feeling of having no power over people and events mm -hmm. is generally unbearable to us. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants more power. Correct. That's what is the impetus for this book. Yes. Um, basically, I, I think that uh, you know there are many ways to explain what makes a human being a human being. It's the, that we're rational creatures, that we have an opposable thumb, etc. And I thought that there was something a little more an elemental, that there's something in our animal nature that isn't quite gotten at in a lot of these books that are written about power and who we are. And just in my own personal experience and in my wide-ranging reading of history, I just noticed this trend that everybody wants power. And power isn't, it's generally seen in the sort of ugly light of you want power, you want to you know, become president, you want to uh, become, take over other countries, but it's not that. I know it's very funny you should say that. That was my son's first concern. He says, Dad, this seems like an awfully harsh book. And in fact, one of the lines I was going to even say, there is that, that sort of devious part of power mm -hmm. that is a little unsettling for the human being. Yes, and I, I maintain that in our country, in our culture in particular, where there's a lot of kind of negativity and guilt around the whole phenomena of power. Um, but I, I, I think that, and in other cultures, particularly places if you've ever lived in a country like Italy or France, they're much more up, uh, you know, uh, straightforward about the whole thing, and there isn't this guilt about it. But the thing is, everybody wants that feeling of control, uh, that you have some power over the people around you, in the sense that if you talk to them, that you can at least persuade them with your ideas, that you can get them to do what you want, um, that you have s just a feeling of control in your life, and the sense that you can't control anything, that you have no influence over the people around you, you have no influence over your, your wife, your kids, your boss, your colleagues, is so miserable that it will tur you know, turn you into almost like a monster, basically. And that a person who is ha uh, um, happy with themselves and feeling comfortable with this knowledge that they want power is actually, in the long run, a better person to be around. Isn't that funny? Because misery and unhappiness is truly the root of all evil. You're very right. So mm. when you feel a little bit more in control, yeah. you're empowered. You feel a little bit better about yourself and, and therefore mm. affect people around you in a more positive way. Well, there's the famous quote um, that power, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely, that people quote a lot. But then um, uh, Malcolm X came out with the, with the quote that having no power corrupts even more absolutely. So the sense of feeling like you have no power, no control, is actually more corrupting in, in the long run. 
you know, you mentioned Malcolm X. The, mm. I'd like to just give a little bit of the construction of the book because okay. it's done in a very unique way. First, there is the law itself. All 48 of them are laid out the book, and we will get to some of my favorite in a, yes. in a moment. Then it is followed by a term you call judgment, which I, I, I defined as sort of the definition of the law or the, the way the law plays itself out. Then you come into the transgression of the law, which mm -hmm. is what happens when you don't follow this law. Right. And what you use throughout the book, both in the transgression and the next part, the observance, is historical references. Right. You go in and you give examples from history to almost to the present, but it, uh, I'd say at least till the 40s, 50s, even, did you go to the 60s? I don't think so. But yeah, World War bit. II, you hit a little bit there as well. And then you go to the interpretation of the law. Then you have this subject called the keys to power. Mm -hmm. This is sort of the summation, practical usage of the law. Like you said, this is not just people who want to climb to become president or right. assess the power, but how can you in your everyday life utilize this to benefit yourself and those around you? Right. And then finally you have these marvelous quotes in red. They, they form on the outsides of the pages, they form the borders, they form sometimes in the middle of it. So you really keep getting reinforced over and over mm -hmm. again. So you almost don't have to study the book it almost naturally studies itself as you read it. Uh-huh, yes. I, I sort of see it as kind of like a, a poison, like a vaporous poison that you, you sort of, the book, the more you read it, you don't have, the ideas kind of get under your skin, that you don't have to literally understand and reread and reread an idea, that months later, you will have internalized the ideas just by reading the quotes and the whole way it's structured. So. Yeah, and because depending on how you think, certain things will reinforce the idea a little bit more than others. Maybe it's the history, if yes. you like to read history. Yes. Maybe it is the quote. Maybe it's just your key to the power. Right. So I found you can, you can benefit and absorb in, in, in any direction. Yes. Before we get into the actual laws, I want to just go over some of the general principles that you uh, line out. And the first one is the most important of these skills and powers. The crucial foundation is the ability to master your emotions. That yeah. goes, that's not even a law in itself. That is in the preface, preface to the laws of power. Yes. Um, basically, uh, the, the power game requires a degree of mastery over yourself. That's sort of like the, the, the building block that you must work with. That if you have no self-control, it, you're, it's hopeless. The whole power game is hopeless. None of these laws will mean anything to you because every time you get yourself into a situation, you will react emotionally, anger, uh, you'll, you, you'll be upset, you'll be envious or whatever. And all of these emotional responses are extremely dangerous in the power game. Now, that doesn't mean at home or with your wife or whatever that you have to be completely emotionless. I'm talking about the power game. I'm talking about in the office or out in the social world. You have to have a degree of control over your emotions. It's, it's just like the law number one, as you say. You know what, what follows that, and, and it's very interesting. I look at mm. this as part history book, part self-help book, because it, it does both simultaneously. And yet, there are certain things that actually contradict some self-help books, but yet I found very useful. And I want to discuss them with you, two sure. in particular. One is distance yourself from the present moment. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had Ram Dass on and everyone being here, living in the now, that's the classic thing. So when I read that, distance yourself from the present moment, I said, I must talk to him about that. And the other mm -hmm. was, examine what has grievously held you back. Because so many self-help books tell you not to overanalyze. And I don't think you mean overanalyze, but you really do mean to critically look back on what you've done in the past, and yet, I got the impression you mean not to be judgmental when you do it. Right, right. There's, you're, not, you're not criticizing yourself. There's this notion, I'm writing about this right now in my new book on war and strategy. Uh, the notion that, you, that permeates my books is that you are responsible for the things that happen in your life. You're the agent of what is good and what is bad. And when something bad happens to you, your natural tendency will be to look out in the world and blame this person, blame your mother, your father, your wife, your boss. But in fact, there's always a kernel of yourself that is to blame for what happened. 
And so the process that's involved in this that I talk about in the book is you look at yourself and you examine how perhaps something you did, something you said, something in your planning was wrong and that that was what caused this problem. And that should be a liberating thing because what that means is you have power. You're not dependent on, on mommy or daddy or boss or whomever to, to please you, to make you, to bring you what you want. You are the one responsible for it. So when you're looking at yourself and, and analyzing yourself, it's not with this heaviness of, oh my gosh, I'm just such an awful person and I hate wow. myself. It's with a lightness. It's like, I can change this. I can go at this. I won't make the same mistake before. I will look at my past and reassess it and see that I did this thing at this one critical crossroad in life. I made this mistake. I will not make it again. And I think that should not be a, a heaviness. It's a kind of a light feeling. Well, you know, you say even, you, you give us this permission because you say that there is nothing natural about power. So it would mm. in turn imply you'd almost have to make those mistakes to discover that yourself. Yes, mistakes are completely healthy and, and completely good. And if you're not making mistakes, you're never going to grow. If you're so caught up in the present moment, you have no perspective on life. You're always, always reacting to what other people give you. And I have the metaphor in this book of the gods on Mount Olympus who have perfect vision of the future and everything that happens around them. And that mortals have none of this. We're so trapped in the present moment, we have no perspective. Am I saying the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? I don't know. And then in the ancient Greek world, there was a character like Odysseus or the great statesman Pericles who was a step between the human and the gods. These were people who had a degree, what the Greeks called prudence. They were able to distance themselves from themselves and look at the future and look what was going around them with a, a dispassionate eye. And that, to me, is sort of the ultimate. That's sort of the ideal that, that we should be... Uh, I is. think the key word, and I have to mention it because I see so many times, is that dispassionate eye. Because when mm. you do look at the past or the future with that emotional eye attached to it, that's when you can sometimes get what we'll call depressed. Literally, if you, so. if you don't do that, am I right? You very need to so. distance yourself from yourself in a, in a very strange way. I mean, to go outside of my book, the, there's a very great poet, Robinson Jeffers, a California poet, and his whole school of thought was the objectivism, getting outside of yourself, looking at nature, looking at the world around you, and becoming absorbed in this beautiful world around you is actually a lot healthier than being constantly locked in yourself and, emo and your own emotions. So. There's another one, and again, we haven't even, I love this about, about this book, is mm -hmm. I haven't even gotten into Law 1 yet. So, okay. and, and by the way, I won't go in order, and we're never going to cover all 48. I'll let the viewers know that right away. Sure. This line here, because, and I think you give example and example of it over and over again in the book, and that is half your mastery of power comes from what you do not do. Oh, very, very, very important, yes. What you don't do, out of realizing it'll cost you too much, and what do I mean by costs? I don't mean money. I mean time. I mean your emotional entanglement in something that's not worth it, um, on and on. But most importantly, time. You realize before you do something, it's not worth it. I'm not going to get embroiled in this fight that other, another person's trying to suck me into. I'm not going to get emotional and react to what this person does. And the most powerful people in the world are those who know what not to do. It's a very powerful tool. Let's go in to sure. the laws. And the only two I will tell the viewers I won't miss because I find this uniquely interesting. I mm -hmm. don't believe that there is an order of what makes one person more powerful in the 48. In other words, it doesn't start with the most important and end with the least important. But I do find that usually the first one and the last one are a little different because a lot of work had to go into deciding which one am I putting first and which one am I putting last. The Very rest, true. I think you can just mix them around. Mm -hmm. So I want to hit the number one. Never outshine the master. And what made this an interesting law for me is when you think of power, mm -hmm. you almost think that the person is the master who has the power. Right. Okay? So I, when you read this, though, what I, and in fact, I had this discussion with my wife yesterday when I was trying to come to terms with that concept. Mm -hmm. The first thing that popped in my mind was the Bob Dylan song, Everybody's Gotta Serve Somebody. Right. Right. And that's the essence I got out right. of this on the way to power. And by the way, it really could even be the transcend transcendental power even that you are serving. It really means, Most definitely. am I right? It really means do not outshine 
the master, whoever it might be. Everyone has a master. I mean, even uh, George W. Bush, the president of the most powerful country in the world, he serves the American public. And if he doesn't do the right things, he's going to be voted out of office. Everybody has a master. So, um, and the thing is, is that th the essence of that law is, and the reason I started it off that way, is it's the most common mistake that people make in the world. It's the most common power mistake. I have made this mistake actually on, on several occasions, and everybody I talk to has made the mistake. And what it basically boils down to is the following. You're in, let's say, a work situation, and you want to please your boss, your master, whomever that is. Um, and you work really hard, and you show him or her that you're capable of all of these great things. Um, you, you write an extra special report, blah, blah, blah. And then in the end, you find out that your, your boss or whomever is actually a little bit cold to you, doesn't, isn't actually impressed. And what has happened is you've gone too far. You've made the boss feel insecure, made them feel like you're better than him or her, that actually um, people like you more than they like the master. And so you have to be very careful that the, the first things you should do in such a situation is actually to make your, your boss, your master, whomever, feel comfortable that you're not after their position, that you recognize that they are above you. A, a lot of these things we're talking about in here seem like, well, you're, you're discussing something in the 17th century. This is, we're in a democratic world. We don't have masters and such and such. And that's, I think, the, the problem a lot of people have is we may look so modern in 21st century, but certain basic things haven't changed. And the person that you are working for is just like a Cesare Borgia, is just like Louis XIV. They have the same insecurities that have existed for hundreds of years, and you have to not make them feel insecure, but make them feel good about themselves. In fact, you say that that's, this is the one law that a lot of people have a big problem with, yes. because inadvertently, as you said, by trying to do the best you can yes. for the person you're serving, you make them feel uncomfortable. That's a yes. very unique twist in, in, in this particular law. Yes. By the way, you have, I want to tell the viewers too, for every law, you have a reversal. Some don't, and I want to, want to hit on those as, as we go. In fact, the next one I want to hit on uh -huh. has no reversal. Right. I like those for the most part. I don't know why. <laughs> I was more attracted to the laws that have no reversal. Uh -huh. So much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life. And again, in fact, you even say that there is no possible reversal for that one. Right. Well, the, the gist of that is that um, we are creatures that judge other people by their appearances. So, for instance, I don't know who Barry Kibrick is inside. I don't know what, who you are. I've just met you. I don't know what makes you tick or whatever. So I have to judge you by what I see, by the way you dress, by the people you surround yourself with, by just what I, the appearances. And because I judge by the appearances, Something like a reputation is a critical component. So if, for instance, before coming on the show, I know that Barry Kibrick has this reputation for being uh, absolutely a brilliant interviewer who asks these kinds of questions, etc., your reputation precedes you, and it's kind of this powerful thing. So even before I come on the show, I'm sort of impressed with you. I know who you are, and that changes the whole dynamic because that reputation is like your pedestal of power. It's what people see when you're walking out in public. It's how people judge you. And if you don't protect it, and if you do something that will make them think, oh, he's not actually uh, such, a, such a good interview. He's not actually such a powerful person. It's a devastating thing, because once your reputation is ruined, it's very hard to build it back up. Oh, there's no doubt. And, and like you said, it really does make an introduction for you, basically. And it's, yeah, it's like it's, a, you know. It was funny, I, when I, the person who turned me on to this book mm -hmm. was a, a wonderful woman named Sandra Nahan. And when I got the book, I was joking with my wife and I said, Betty Lou, I failed all of these laws of power. I and doubt that. I, but it I was very that. funny. The one that I, I starred when that happened, and as I said, the book has been out for a while, was always say less than uh -huh. necessary. Uh -huh. And I know that that was something that I had to take control of because right. I know, I even joke, with my own bosses here, the joke was always, not only do I gild the lily, I'll gild the gilded lily. <laughs> and you have to be very cautious of that. Well, as an interviewer, though, you have to be able to talk a little bit. Maybe that's where the reversal on this one will come in, of course. Yeah. But, it's, but still, it's not, 
saying more than you have to say to get to where you need to go. I could have almost started the book with that law because it's also that's the second biggest mistake that people make. <laughs> See, I'm know? going in order here from my own mistakes. <laughs> I mean, and we've all had that feeling. You, you go on a job interview and you're nervous and you just talk and talk and talk and in the process of talking, you say something that's probably stupid, you probably say something that's going to offend the person, you don't really know, but you just have this feeling, I talk too much. And so what you have to do is you have to get control of your tongue and you have to learn that in any situation, of course, when you're in the house, you can relax a little bit, but in any kind of situation uh, in, the, in the world, you, you have to uh, basically be aware of yourself, be aware how other people are perceiving you. And the person who, in, let's say in a meeting, in, in, an, in a work situation, the person who talks too much seems weak, seems like they have no control over themselves. Um, and the person who talks less has a more kind of powerful appearance, more uh, powerful persona. So we said earlier you have to control your emotions. Well, if you can't control your tongue and your propensity to always talk, you're, you're just as hopeless as if you can't control your emotions. When asking for help, appeal to people's self-interest. That's the law. But what I thought the most interesting line was, do not confuse your needs with theirs. And again, I sense when people are striving for something, that has got to be another one of those common mistakes. You are thinking about what you want, what you desire, what you may even know is so right. And yet, if you confuse that with what the needs of those who you're going to, mm -hmm. you have a big problem in power. Well, everybody um, operates by self-interest. And I don't mean by that a negative comment. I, I think that that's just the truth. And I think if you recognize the truth, it's, it's a lot better. And so I operate by what's in my own self-interest and everybody else around me does. So when you want to get something from someone, you need their help. You need them. We're always in need of help. You need them to do a favor for you. Whatever it is, your first step has to be uh, detach yourself. Get a, become calm. Don't think of what you need and what you want. First, think of what is how they're operating, what's inside their head. It's just a critical step that permeates everything you do in this game. Knowing what the other person wants, getting inside their skin, thinking inside of them, and, and what will appeal to their self-interest. I'm going to those again without reversals so that okay. I can make sure I at least cover those and we'll try to come back to some others. Recreate yourself. Right. There is again no reversal. Do not accept the roles that society foists upon you. You have the ability to be the master of your own image. One of the most empowering mm -hmm. laws in the book. Right. It should be. Um, basically, we talked about that feeling of having no control and how miserable it is. Rela related to that is the feeling that I'm trapped in this role in life. Um, that is not of my own choosing. Uh, people see me as a writer or a secretary or whatever, and it's not what I want to be, and that's how everybody judges me, and you feel trapped and you have no power or control. The opposite of that is this feeling that you can be whatever you want. You can recreate yourself. You can suddenly uh, have a different persona. You can change your personality. By the way, one of the actual other laws is you can act like the king already. So in a sense, I, I found those two working together. You can recreate yourself, and the other law was be royal already. So right. maybe that's what you need to recreate yourself into. Completely. Um, you know, the power game is, a, is all about psychology. It's not about money. It's not about who you can push around. It's all about psychology. And it begins in, in how you think of yourself. The one that I thought captured my attention was do not go past the mark you aimed for mm -hmm. because in that victory mm -hmm. is when you can start to gain problems that you no. weren't expecting. You know I did a lot of research for this book and uh, the theme would repeat itself over and over and over and over again throughout history of the ruler, the country, the empire that became drunk on its own success and didn't know when to stop. It's almost inhuman to know when to stop. And the thing is, is that the theme I'm talking about is that sometimes success is the worst thing that can happen to you. Because you, you, you don't 
um, you suddenly lose a sense of, of what it is that actually happened that led to your success. Sometimes it's luck. Sometimes it's something that you did, but you're not really aware of what you did. And you only think of your success, and you get drunk on it, and you go and you keep doing more and more and more, and, and you, it ends up in a disaster. And so there's an expression that the Japanese have it, but it's in all cultures. The moment you have success or victory, that's the time to step back, calm down, reassess where you are, and in fact consolidate and not go ahead because you're, you're headed towards a disaster otherwise. Robert, I mm -hmm. said that I will make sure I say the first law yes. and the last law. Yeah. And I want to end with the last law. Assume formlessness. Mm -hmm. What was interesting about this law was that, as you say, accept the fact that nothing is certain and no law is fixed. Right. What I liked about this is and by the way, formlessness, as you say, does not mean to be uh, amorphous. It doesn't mean that you don't have structure or, or sense. Definitely it not. means that, in a sense, well, you joke about it, but you, you sort of can't take it too seriously. Right. Right. It's, that's, in a nutshell, I don't know how else to describe it, but that's what it was. You yeah. even poke fun mm -hmm. of yourself. You even sell us not to, what is the word? Too much respect for other people's wisdom will make you depreciate your own. That's what this last one's about. Yes, I mean, Ralph Waldo Emerson is one of my favorite writers, and in his essay on self-reliance, he's basically telling that. You, you have to basically rely on your own wisdom and be um, alive to your own circumstances and strategizing and doing what's necessary for you. And not if you sit there and just read books and listen to what other people tell you, you're hopeless, because you'll never be able to think on your own. And so. Uh, the, the formlessness is the fact that you're fluid with, in life. The most powerful people have a fluidity. And as they get older, they don't r get rigid. They retain their youthful fluidity. And they're able to move with the times, change. Their ideas change. And with that, it's, so it's a, it's a psychological game more than anything else. And you, with that, you retain your youthfulness and your ability to play the power game. Well, Robert. I'm not throwing this one out. No. I'm going to keep it. I no. thank you so much oh, thank you. for your wisdom, sir. And thank, thank you, you for joining us today. Now, before Robert leaves, I would like to leave you with these final words by Robert himself from the 48 Laws of Power. Learning to adapt to each new circumstance means seeing events through your own eyes and often, as Robert just said, ignoring the advice that people constantly peddle your way. It means that ultimately you must throw out the laws that others preach and the books they write to tell you what to do. I'm Barry Kibrick. Through your own eyes you must see. And if it means you must throw out the laws that others preach and the books they write, please give them a read between the lines before you do. And you'll be amazed at the power you can reap. Thank you, Robert. Oh, thank you very much, Barry. If you would like a videotape of an episode or would like to become a member of our book club, just drop us an email at barrykibrick at aol.com.